for real, preparing ourselves. Um, the Israelites had a tradition as they went up to the house of worship that they would prepare themselves as they went to the house of worship. And this is Psalm 134. It's called A Song of Ascents as they were ascending up to the place of worship. And it says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. And I love this idea that we're just called to lift up our hands and whether literally or figuratively to give it back to God. So we're going to do that right now. Why don't you stand with us so we're going to get ourselves ready for worship. As you're standing, I just want to open us up with some prayer. God, I thank you that you have brought us here into the sanctuary, into the house of worship. I thank you that uh, we are here to lift our hands to you. Whether literally or figuratively, we are here to reflect back and give back to you all that we have. God, I pray that you are inhabiting our praise and that this time is a time where we forget about ourselves, we forget about the troubles of the week, we forget about the worries that we have. And we just reflect on you and we give you all the thanks and praise.
so much to turn back and reflect our praises to you with, Lord. to introduce a new song and when we do that I understand it's a little bit uncomfortable because we don't know it all together so we're gonna teach this to you we're gonna sing a line I'm gonna sing a line and then Michelle's gonna join me we're gonna sing that line a second time so join me on the second time for each of these lines it goes like this praise to the Father who gave us the Son here we go praise to the Father he gave us the Son, and praise to the Spirit who's living in us. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Here we go. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Cause that's what Jesus sky with 
through the shades of his glory wakes us with mercy and love jesus does who holds the orphan and comforts the widow cries for injustice and feels every sorrow Jesus does. Let's sing that chorus together. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Yeah. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Cause that's what Jesus from our sins. You reconcile us to, to God through your sacrifice, through your mercy and love on the cross to die for our sins, to bring us into right relationship with God, to bring us into everlasting life and everlasting joy. We praise you that you do that, God. Amen. You know, Memorial Day weekend, it is definitely a time when we look back, we reflect, and there truly is so much to be thankful for and grateful for those men and women who have given the ultimate price uh, for our freedom so that we actually have the freedom to even be here in a place like this and, and worship together and read God's word. Um, it really is a, truly a blessing. And uh, we just have so much to be thankful for. You know, matter of fact, real quick, um, I would like to just acknowledge anybody in here today who... Uh, is serving or has served in our military. If you could, real quick, just stand. 
Brother Todd, Brother Dave, yeah, Brother Robin. All right, let's give them a hand, you guys. We appreciate uh, that sacrifice and uh, just so thankful. So thankful for those also, as I said, that have given their lives for, for our freedom. And you know, um, when I think about that, every Memorial Day, I often also think about uh, really what we, just, uh, what we were just singing. And just the idea that Jesus himself has also given, and he paid the ultimate price for our freedom and uh, freedom from sin, and so just so grateful, so many things to think about and, and to be thankful for this weekend, and, and then to come full circle at the end of our service today, uh, we're going to have a, a baby dedication, and uh, the tattoos are going to be dedicating their son Caleb, and uh, so, you know, in one sense, we're thankful for those who have given themselves, given their lives for us, and then here we are welcoming a new little one and uh, in their service to the Lord in the future as well, so it's uh, just a blessing. If you will, uh, turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this morning. And uh, we're going to read a section of scripture together, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of dive into some thoughts. And I've got a few points for you this morning. Um, and if you don't have a Bible, you can follow along with a Bible in front of you there in a pew, or I'll throw it up on the screen for you um, as well. And if my clicker, I can get that baby working. go. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 17 to 31 together, and uh, I want you to follow along with me as we read. It says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. He goes on to say, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? These were the religious leaders and uh, followers of the law. And, and he says, Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. He goes on to say, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised, Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord." So I have a, a, a story for you real quick. I heard of a, there was a, a dishonest manager. He was waiting or wanting to hire um, someone for his accounting department, okay? And um, he needed somebody that thought like he thought. And that was very important to him. And so he waited for applications to come in. And he looked over a pile of applications. And he had narrowed it down to three final applicants for the job. And he started to interview them with the next you know, the next day, and the first applicant, he comes in, and he sits down, and the manager begins with a little bit of small talk, you know, just to kind of get to know each other, and, and maybe calm the nerves of the applicant a little bit, and, and eventually he asks the applicant this question. He says, what does two plus two equal? The man was a little bit confused by the question, and I thought to himself, well, it is an accounting position. Uh, eventually he answers, he says, well, that's kind of simple, he answers four. 
And the manager thanked the applicant for his time, and he led him out of his office. The next applicant comes on in, and again, the manager, they begin a little bit of small talk, uh, eventually gets around to asking the man the same question. And the second applicant, he said, well, two plus two. Well, I mean, there's several possibilities. He said, you know, two and two make four, but so does three and one, and, you know, or 2.5 and 1.5, and, you know, they also make four. And so he says there's a number of ways to arrive at the same answer. And the manager thought, well, that was a pretty good reply. He told, you know, I might be calling you back. Uh, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, just hold on to my business card. I might call you back. So he leads him out of the office. Finally, the third applicant comes in. And again, the manager spent some time talking about different things. Eventually asks the man the same question as the others. He says, what does 2 plus 2 equal? The third applicant seems a little startled, a little, you know, taken aback by such a simple question. And he looks at the manager, he cautiously looks around the room, you know, he goes over and he gets up, he goes over and he closes the door of the office, he comes back and he sits down at the desk and he leans across and he says with a real low voice, what do you want the answer to be? <laughs> <laughs> what do you know, he got the job. <laughs> what is the answer to what the world needs most. What do you and I, what do we need most? Is Christianity reasonable? Is a belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Messiah, is that, is that reasonable? What answer are you looking for? Does the Bible, does God's Word, the Bible have the answer? Is it logical? Is Jesus the answer? Well, I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. The question, the answer I came up with after reading some of these scriptures is that um, it all depends. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Larry, don't you have a pretty firm stance on this? Yes, I do, but for you and for others in the world, it depends. You say, well, what do you mean it depends? Like the manager, what answer are you looking for? That's why it depends. Depends on what answer you are looking for, what kind of answer you want. What answer is the world looking for? I mean, if I were just to simply ask you who come to church on a regular basis on Sundays, um, if I said to you, say amen if Jesus is the answer, what would you say? Amen. amen, of course. Because that's the answer you know, that's the answer you were looking for, and that's the answer we know to be the truth. But what answer is the world looking for? What would you like the answer to be? You see, if Christianity, if it offers the answer you're looking for, then it is reasonable. It is logical. Even though it is faith-based, there is a lot of logic involved in it as well, more than most people would admit. But Paul tells us in our passage this morning that there are people out there who don't like Christianity because, like the manager, it doesn't offer the kind of answer that they want to hear, and so they reject it. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 1. Look at verse 23 again. He says, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. The cross is a stumbling block to many people. It absolutely is. It's a stumbling block to many people. And I would say it's foolishness to a lot of people. In fact, there's something about the message of the cross, Jesus dying on the cross, that actually does make people feel uneasy. Um, it even annoys some people. It even makes some people upset. Sometimes they get downright nasty about it. Even though you tell them that Jesus actually didn't do it for himself, he was doing it for you and doing it for me. He was sacrificing himself. When we hear people, about people sacrificing their lives for our freedom and for the country, we look at that and say, oh, thank you. When we find out that Jesus did it for our sins, we look at that and people get nasty about it. It's because it's not the answer they were looking for. It's not the answer they wanted to hear. Because with that kind of an answer comes some accountability. And I'll tell you, some people just don't want to be accountable. There was uh, the Roman historian, his name was Tacitus. You know what he called Christianity? He called Christianity a pernicious, a pernicious superstition. 
Freud, Freud believed that religion in general, and Christianity in particular, he actually considered it to be a psychotic illness. A psychotic illness. Now listen to this one. This, I, found, I got a kick out of this one. Back in the day, a former attorney general under Bill Clinton, her name was Janet Reno. This is what she said. I quote, A cultist, okay, a cultist is one who has a strong belief in the Bible and the second coming of Christ, who frequently attends Bible studies, who have a high level of financial giving to a Christian cause, who homeschools their children, Me, <laughs> my dyna, I'm identifying with all <laughs> who has accumulated survival foods and has a strong belief in the Second Amendment. Well, I mean, kind of that, part of that, I guess, maybe a little bit. I don't, who distrusts big government. Any of these, she said, any of these may qualify a person as a cultist. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to River Life Christian Church, right? Tacitus, Freud, Janet Reno, just a few, just a few of those who are offended by the message of the cross. It literally makes them angry to think that anyone would even embrace that belief. But here's the thing. When you put your faith and hope and your trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you begin to understand more and more and more just what the cross means and that the cross of Christ is the answer to the power of God. You know, a lot of times people think of the power of God and they think, well, you know, the oceans and how he holds the oceans back and he created the stars and the heavens and the universe and he holds the sun and the moon and the stars in their place and, I mean, just, oh, the power of God. Or they think of miracles and, and that type of thing. You know what scripture actually kind of references real power of God is? is when a sinner becomes a saint. When a person once lived for themselves and then they decided to trust in Christ and live for Christ and live for God. That is the power of God. And a cross, the cross is the reminder of that. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, as we read earlier, he says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So again, the cross is, the cross of Christ is, it's the right answer. It is the right answer, if it's the answer you're looking for. But I'll tell you that most of the world is not, it's not the answer because they're not looking for that. That's not the answer they want, that's not the answer they're looking for. Uh, many people only want an answer that will give them control of their own lives. That is the truth, they want to be in charge I mean, even as Christians, you still have that. You still, this desire to be in charge kind of wells up in you sometimes. I know what that's like. I'm sure you do as well. But the Bible, listen, the Bible offends people because it shows us that our lives should be controlled by God. The Bible actually, it's a mirror. The Bible calls itself a mirror. And when you look in the mirror of God's word and his standard, you look at it and you go, whoa, there's some things about my character that doesn't line up with his standard. And I don't like that. I want to be in charge of my own life, and I don't want to be accountable, and so I'm going to set up my own standard of living and forego God's standard. The Bible offends people. And the cross shouts out to the world that God bought you with a price. It was a heavy price when he sent his son, Jesus, and so the Bible says that because of that, we are no longer our own. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to God. If you accept the answer of the cross, then you're giving authority in your life over to him. That's the power of the cross. How many of you guys know that that answer doesn't sit well with a lot of folks? I mean, many even reject belief in God altogether because they don't want someone else dictating to them how to live their life. And it's a big thing nowadays. Nowadays, it's, it's a big thing to, um, you know, for people to say, well, you know, that might be right or wrong for you, but that's not what's right or wrong for me. But that only goes so far. 
I mean, imagine how many standards of what is right and wrong are out there now if that's really the truth. If that's the truth, then, then listen, you could go back to World War II, and for World War II and, and, and the, German, the Nazi Germany, they were right in their own eyes. Their standard was right. They thought what they were doing was, was right. Well, who is anybody to come along and say that they were wrong? Well, they were doing this and they were doing that. Well, that doesn't matter to them. That only matters to your standard. So again, my, my simple question is, then whose standard ultimately are we going by? Well, society's standard. Well, they were society back. They had their own society, and they were in agreement. Not everybody, but the majority, they followed. So whose standard are we going to go by? I would submit to you that the Bible has a standard. God's word, God gave us a standard. The problem is, again, nobody wants to live by that standard. They want to live by their own as long as they're not hurting anyone else. So they reject it altogether. They want a God who basically will change for them. They, they want to be the ones to say how they should run their lives. And so what happens is, is they set, and we've, we all have done this, where we, we set up our own standard, we set up ourselves as our own little gods and we worship at the altar of ourselves and I do what I want you do what you want and, and you know what a matter of fact if you don't do things the way I want you to do them well then I'm, I'm going to have issues with you I mean imagine think about how that works do you guys remember King Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego you guys remember the fiery furnace and and how King Nebuchadnezzar he had set up a new rule in the kingdom. He signed the decree. Whenever the music plays, everybody has to bow down and worship the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar that was built. And if you didn't bow down to that idol, then you would be thrown into the fiery furnace. In other, in other parts of the Bible, you know, other instances where they'd be thrown into the lion's den, things of that nature. And so what's interesting here is that what happens is we become King Nebuchadnezzar. I set up my own opinion of how I think things should be, my own standard. I set that up, and if you disagree with my standard, if you don't bow down and worship my opinion, well, then I'm going to punish you with my words and my attitude. And, and I'm going to let you know <laughs> that you're wrong and I'm right and I mean, social media, you just get on social media for a little, way, a little while, it, it just, I can't do it. I, I just, I stay away from it now, I can't do it. You see all kinds of standards on there, don't you? The cross is not the answer that people are looking for. The cross isn't the, wor the answer the world wants to, to hear. They want to run their own lives, and that was the problem for the Jews of Jesus' day. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now you say, well, what is actually going on here? They were actually demanding, the Jewish people at the time were demanding miraculous signs. They wanted proof. They wanted to see miracles. But, G, but you know, didn't Jesus do miracles? I mean, he did miraculous things during his ministry on earth. There were, there were thousands of eyewitnesses, some that wrote about it. We have it in Scripture today. It's, it's in history and of course he did these miracles. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed, one, he fed thousands of people at a time with just five loaves and two fish like we talked about last week. Um, and because he did those things, guess what happened? Multitudes of people continued to follow him. Wherever he went, people would, would crowd the land and the area, the shoreline, wherever he would be speaking, sometimes for hours. Thousands of people followed Jesus. That is, until he was crucified. As a matter of fact, earlier on in his ministry, there was a time when he was teaching, and some of his disciples, some of his followers at the time, the Bible says that they turned and followed him no more, and their words were, that's a hard teaching. Basically, they were saying, that's, that's too much. I, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. And so they followed him no more. It wasn't the answer they were looking for. It's amazing. As long as the 
As long as Jesus was, was doing what they wanted him to do, they'd follow him. You see, I think that's so similar today. As long as God is the kind of God that I can follow, then I'll follow him. But right when I find something that I don't, I don't know, well, then I'm not going to follow him anymore. You know, once Jesus was arrested and condemned and crucified, they walked away. The cross was not the answer they were looking for. They were actually looking for a physical king to come in and remove them from the government and the oppression of the Roman Empire. That's what they were wanting. It wasn't the answer they were looking for. You know, a lot of people who have rejected Christ in their lives have done it for that same reason. Maybe God didn't answer your prayer one time. Maybe he didn't answer the prayer in the way and in the time that you wanted. Or maybe something happened in that person's life that really hurt them and they felt betrayed because God didn't protect them from that pain. And so they, they walked away. And, and you see, God is, God is always love, and that's all God is. And so if anything bad ever happens to me, then there must not be a God. I would just submit and encourage you to read God's word to us and get to know who God is and how he interacts with his creation. And we'll get a better understanding of maybe why he does or allows some things to happen in our lives. So as long as God did what they wanted done, they were willing to follow, but but no, he didn't protect them from suffering and hardship. That, that wasn't what they signed up for. You know, no, no, that wasn't the God that I wanted. They wanted a God who would protect them from all the difficulties of life. And, and you know what's interesting is the cross itself flies in the face of that idea. The cross actually portrays death. My friends, the cross back then would be similar to like an electric chair would be to us today. You know, you see people carrying a cross around in their necklace. It'd be like us carrying around a little electric chair charm. <laughs> the cross was a torture device. The Romans devised it in order to kill people with it. They, it was a horrible way to die, and that was their torture device they used to torture people and kill people. I mean, the cross was, a, it's a, a picture, it portrays death, it portrays suffering, it portrays pain and loss, and it literally shouted to the people then, and it should shout to the world today, that things, guess what? They often aren't fair, and they're not always just. Jesus never sinned. He was an innocent man, and they crucified him. Couldn't have been anything more unfair. It shouts to the church that even God's people are often required to endure suffering and tragedy and hardship and pain. Sometimes we do. The cross tells us that life doesn't always turn out the way that you want it to, but that that life will ultimately turn out the way that God wants it to. And that is exactly what happened with Christ. And it was for our benefit. You know, Jesus said in this world, he himself, in John 16, 33, the second half of that verse Jesus himself said, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart, he said, because I have overcome the world. The cross tells us that this world, it, it's going to be difficult. It may be more difficult for others, so we, we're going to have trouble, but there is something better on the other side. Why? How? Because Jesus overcame the world. And if you're looking for God's answer, that's perfectly reasonable. That's a reasonable thing to do, is to look for God's answer in a difficult, troubled world. And so the cross of Christ tells us the truth about life. There will be suffering, there can be pain. Sometimes we go through that. But I'll tell you, if you're willing to wait on him, if you're willing to wait on Jesus, I promise you, he will carry you through. You know, Psalm, in 20, Psalm 23, many of you know Yea, though I walk through what? I thought it said fields of lilies. <laughs> no. 
it says through the valley of the shadow of death, right? The valley of the shadow of death. You see, the cross tells you the truth about this reality. It doesn't, it doesn't sugarcoat life. And that's because it's the answer that we all need. It's the answer that the world needs. And so, again, first, the world looks for an answer that allows them to be in control. The world looks for an answer also that allows them to be wise. Whatever answer allows me to be wise. He said, what do you mean? Well, listen, Paul wrote, again, he said in 1 Corinthians 1.22, he said the Greeks look for wisdom. So if you weren't a, a Jewish person back then, you were considered a Greek, okay? That's kind of how it went back in Scripture. Uh, biblical times, that's what he, they're talking about here. So the Greeks, meaning you're, you weren't Jewish. He's speaking to everyone that's not Jewish here. He says, um, he says, Greeks looked for wisdom. They wanted to be able to understand the world on whose terms? On their terms. According to their wisdom. According to their intellect. That's how they wanted to understand the world. Um, how many of you in, enjoy understanding things in this world? It's kind of nice when you can get a grasp of something and understand it. Intellectually, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, it's just kind of the way it is. But the Greeks, they were, in Scripture back then in that culture, they were all about wisdom. They were all into wisdom. But to be clear... It was their wisdom. They were into their wisdom. They were a culture known for their philosophers, uh, but their philosophers were looking for wisdom based upon their perceptions and their views of life. Okay? So when it came to God, consider this. When it comes to this higher being or this God, um, If they couldn't explain God, and if they couldn't understand him on their terms, then they weren't happy with that. They weren't going to be settled with that. God had to fit into a box that they built for him. And so if you kind of, just as a college student once told a Christian professor, uh, for me to believe in God, I have to have a God that I can understand. And the professor kind of smiled and said, well, God refuses to be that small. <laughs> I'm kind of thankful that God's bigger than my intellect. If I can understand all that there is to be about God, not much of a God. Not much of a God. And so again, yeah, God refuses to be small enough for us to understand on our terms. In fact, uh, we couldn't understand him in that way if we wanted to. In Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, God declares this. He says, my thoughts, he's talking about himself. God says, my thoughts are higher. He says, they're not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God doesn't fit into a neat little box that we make for him. Based upon my intellect and my wisdom, my earthly limitations, God doesn't fit inside that tiny box. He's different than we are. He thinks differently than we do. He acts differently than we do. Thank God he acts differently than we do. And that's why it's so important to read and study his word, the Bible, because it tells us what we need to know about who God is and what he's like. Is it everything? No. But God gives us what we need and what we can learn and what we can handle. It's important to read his word and understand who he is and what he's like. It tells us about a God that we wouldn't have ever guessed existed. You know, one of the major characteristics of God is found in, in, um, it's found in the cross, really. One of the characteristics of God. Isaiah 59, it starts with the second half of 15, and it goes to verse 17. This is the way, look at this, it describes it this way. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. So it actually displeased God that there was no judgment. Okay. And he saw that there was no man and, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness is sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Now you say, what is that? What is going on here? What is happening here? There was no one else, there was no one else to intercede on our behalf. 
This is what's happening. So God literally clothed himself with righteousness, and he came down to this earth in the person of Jesus to intervene on our behalf in and through his son Christ, but the Greeks couldn't understand that. They couldn't understand a God who would sacrifice himself for these lowly people. None of their Greek gods would do that for them. You notice? Back during the time of Rome, they were interested in the stories of, of the, the, the multitude of deities that the Greeks worshipped. It was, it was called the Pantheon. That's what it was called. But none of their gods were like the God of Scripture. None of them were. They worshipped, you know, they worshipped Zeus. You probably, you know, read about it and learned about it in history or something and in school, but they worshipped Zeus and Poseidon and uh, Aphrodite and many other gods and demigods, but their stories, what's interesting is these gods, their stories describe them as being egotistical and selfish and, and bickering and petty and vindictive, adulterous, heartless, those were their good traits. <laughs> and what's interesting to me is that the Greeks actually worshipped these gods. They made sacrifices to these petty, mean-spirited gods. And you just know they made these gods up. These are all made-up stories. We have no, and I say that because there is zero physical, zero historical evidence of these gods like we do in biblical scripture. There is tons of historical, archaeological, historical information that you can find that point to Scripture. You just have to look for it. Don't take everyone else's word that it doesn't belong. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, um, you know it, that it doesn't. Uh, uh, that it's you know not there. It's not real. You know it, it's it's there. You just got to look for it. But why would the Greeks portray their gods as being so selfish and evil beings? Well, because these are the kind of lifestyles the Greeks identified with. It's the kind of lifestyle that people in general live with. Right? People are egotistical, we're selfish, we're petty, we bicker, we complain. Think about it. These were the kinds of behaviors they could understand because this was how the average Greek viewed life itself and how people are, and it's how they live their lives, and so they created gods in their image rather than like Christianity where we step back and we understand that God created us in Genesis. He says he created us in his image, not to be gods, but to have some of the characteristics of God. They could understand in their wisdom. The Greeks could not understand a God who would sacrifice himself for them because they weren't willing to do that like that God of Scripture. The cross showed them a God that they could not understand in their own wisdom. The God of the Bible is real. Not a God that man cooked up in their basement. Not a God that is the result of man's own personal wisdom. The God of the Bible is is real. This, the God of Scripture is a God that man is always, it, it, they're always trying to learn him. It, it, never going to figure him out. You can read his word for your entire life and, and never know him completely. He's beyond, he's beyond us. And he sent his only son, Jesus, down out of heaven and took our place on the cross. And the God of the Bible loved us enough that he gave his only son, if we would just believe in him, the Bible tells us, God tells us, if you believe in my son, then you will not perish but have everlasting life. That's what he says. And if God is willing to do that, what else would he do for me? See, the God of the Bible isn't based on, again, man's wisdom or man's perception of life. The God of the, of the Christian faith is based in reality. And we have a God who is real, a God who really, truly cares for us. So, again, the world looks for an answer that will give them control of their lives. The world will look for an answer that allows them um, to understand and be wise in their own terms. But lastly, is the world is looking for an answer that will give them strength. On their terms. Again, it's always on their terms. 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, The weakness of God 
is stronger than men. You know, many people today, you know, want to be strong. People today want to be strong. There are gyms everywhere so we can be healthy and strong. You know, I used to go to this, uh, the Crunch Fitness around the corner um, over on Dixie Highway, and I'd, I'd go in there, and I used to have a membership there. And then, you know, you stop going for a little while, and you pay them your royalties for an entire year, and you haven't gone. You're like, man, I'm just wasting my money. I need to get to the gym. You never do. Uh, but, you know, when you're going there, I remember going in there, and you would, you'd, you'd be lifting weights, and you'd be over here doing this, and then you kind of, you know, you're, you're doing some bench presses, and you're looking around, you know, you put the thing back up. And then, you know, this, this lady comes over and gets uh, on the bench next to me, and she puts on, like, twice as much weight as I was doing. She's like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, man, I need to get strong, you know. <laughs> and then you got a guy over there. He looks like he's part gorilla, and he's like, you know. <laughs> like, my goodness, he's been doing that since birth. I know it. <laughs> You're done. You don't even need to be here anymore, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but people want to be strong, Right? If they tell you a story about themselves, they, they want to be the heroes of the story even. Um, for the most part, people, they don't like to come across as being weak. I tell you, listen, as a father and a husband, never want to appear weak. If my wife comes to me and she can't get the jar of jelly open, I'm like, husband's here. I'm ready to save my family from starvation. <laughs> right? And I get to that thing, and if I can't get it, I am in the workshop with a pair of pliers and vice grips. You know, I am opening this thing. I am not going to be up here as weak, right? So this is going to happen. But for the most part, we all come, you know, we don't want to come across as being weak. They don't, we don't like to look like a failure, right? And, and so I don't, nobody wants to hear you messed up. Um, I know I messed up, right? You don't need to tell me, right? They, they just, I don't like to hear it. But, and so... We tend to reject the message sometimes. The world rejects the message of the cross. Why? Because it describes them as have, having sinned. What, you're trying to tell me that there's a reason why I need to be forgiven? I haven't done anything to anyone. But we've all sinned against God. The Bible is very clear when it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And for the wages of sin is death, but the gift is of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So nobody likes the message of the cross because it points out that they, they weren't good enough. I wasn't a loving enough person. I wasn't a good enough person. I was a, you know, I did something wrong. I was a failure in some way. It describes us as having sinned and messed up and being weak. We can't save ourselves. Nobody tells me I can't save myself. Well, when it comes to spiritual death, we can't save ourselves. And the message of the cross isn't so much that, that well, you, you've killed Jesus with your sins. The message of the cross is that we deserved to die on the cross for our own sins, and Jesus simply offered to take our place. That's the message of the cross, that Jesus came to die for those who, yes, had failed, who, yes, couldn't save themselves. Yes, they were weak and broken. And that's why the message of the cross is so powerful for everyone in the world. Because we are all broken in some way. We're broke. You live with me for a couple days, you're going to find how broken Pastor Larry is. Ask my wife. Actually, don't ask my wife. <laughs> or past that. Sometimes I say things and shouldn't have come out of my mouth. Don't ask my wife. We're all broken in some way. We all have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. That is a truth. That is a reality that Scripture teaches. And when people say, oh, I believe everyone's good at heart. Actually, the Bible says that everyone's heart is wicked. It's full of wickedness. And you've got to keep it in check all the time. Because we're all capable of, of sin. Jesus didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. Amen. It sounds like an oh, yeah. I heard an oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> One person observed that anybody could come up with a religion where those who deserved to get into heaven might do so. 
But at the cross, God promised that those who did not deserve heaven could still receive that gift if they believed in Christ and asked for forgiveness of their sin. That's Christianity. That's the message of the Bible and the cross of Christ and what he did for us. Every other religion out there is designed to assure the righteous, the deserving, by their own strength, by their own goodness, somehow they can work or buy their way into heaven. Every other world religion teaches that. The cross tells us that not only does no one deserve heaven, but the only way you can get in is by accepting the sacrifice of Christ. So you have to admit, basically you're admitting, I am weak, I can't do it. I am weak. Uh, I am undeserving. I absolutely have sinned against God. There's no doubt about it. I'm guilty. We're all guilty. I need God's help. The world views that, that idea, the world views it as an insult to their reliance on strength. They want power, not weakness. But my friends, the cross is all about power. It's just, it's all about God's power. It's not about their power. And that's the problem they have. They want it to be their power. It's, it will never be your power. It's what God has done. 1 Corinthians 1.18 again says, The message of the cross to us who are being saved is the power of God. Again, the cross gives the power that the world does not want to accept. It, it, it gives an answer that the world can't provide. And we have got to understand that the cross is our answer to this world because it's, it's only through the cross that lives can truly be changed. That's the power of God changing lives. That's the power of God into salvation. And that is the answer the world needs to hear. You know, over a century ago, there was a minister who worked in the slums of London. His name was Hughes. And he was a man of great faith. He was a man through whom God had done a lot of great things for, for the hurting there. Um, in London, there was also a man named Charles Bradlaugh, one of the most outstanding atheists in England. And apparently, Bradlaugh had heard that Hughes claimed that Christianity offered the answer that men needed in their lives. Um, and so, the, I mean, that was just a notion that deeply offended Bradlaugh, a man that was dedicated to, I mean, he literally would confront and just try to destroy the faith of Christians. And so, Bradlaugh actually challenged Hughes to a debate on the validity of the claims of Christianity. In essence, Brad Laff was challenging him to a debate on whether Christianity was reasonable or not. Um, it didn't take long for news of the challenge to kind of spread throughout London. Brad Laff was a famous debater. People knew that about him. He had humbled many, more than his fair share of preachers in England in his contests. <clears throat> how, would this, how would this humble worker of the slums in Hughes, survives such an established debater. More skilled debaters, more scholarly theologians had been brought to their knees by Brad Laff's talent on the stage. He was a great debater. Hughes accepted the challenge, but with one condition. Hughes said, I propose to you that we each bring some concrete evidences of the validity of our beliefs in the form of men and women who have been redeemed from the lives of sin and shame by the influence of our teaching. I will bring 100 such men and women. And he said, I challenge Brad Laff you to do the same. And then he said, if you cannot bring 100, Mr. Brad Laff, to match my 100, I'll be satisfied if you bring 50. 50 such men and women who will stand and testify that they have been lifted up from lives of shame by the influence of your atheistic teachings. And then he said, if you can't bring 50, then bring 20 who will say, as my hundred will, that they have a, a great joy and a life of self-respect as a result of your atheistic teachings. And then he said, if you can't bring 20, I'll be satisfied if you just bring 10. Nay, Mr. Brad Laff, I challenge you to bring one. Just one man or woman who will make such a testimony regarding the uplifting of your atheistic teachings. And he left it at that. And Brad Laff withdrew his challenge. <laughs> For the first time. Essentially Hughes was saying. The reasonableness of Christianity is in the changed lives that it produces. 
That's the answer of the cross. That is the power of the cross. That is not to say that Christians are perfect. My goodness, we are not perfect. But God's working on us every day, I can tell you that. Man's attempt to try and control their lives, however, man's attempt to live by their own wisdom, man's attempts to, uh, to live by their own strength, they all fail. At some point, we fail because those are really not life-changing answers. They can maybe help temporarily in times, but it's not life-changing. Most of us here, as Christians, we've already accepted the answer of the cross in our lives, but maybe, I don't know, maybe you know someone who doesn't accept that. Someone who is living by answers that reject the cross, that reject Christ. I would encourage you to talk with them and share with them, love them, come alongside them and be there for them. Jesus said that a new commandment I give to you, love them as I have loved you. Love them the way you want to be loved and cared for. But at some point, you may need to ask them in their own beliefs and in their own life, how is it working for you? The way that you're doing life, is, is that good enough? Is that working out for you? Do you sleep good at night? Or do you struggle with sleeplessness because of the things that you've done or things that you've said that you don't feel forgiveness for? Do you feel good about yourself? Do you believe that if, if you were to die today that you would be able to stand confidently before God in right standing before God? Would you be able to do that? Not based upon your good deeds, but based upon the belief in Jesus, God's Son, whom He sent. Yes, Christians, we need to realize the cross is the answer that the world needs. We need to say with Paul when he said, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so I close by just simply saying the cross gives the answers. I truly believe the Bible, God's word, the cross of Jesus gives the answers to every single struggle in life. Every struggle I've ever had, I can find the answers in God's word. But my friend, first you have to lay your life down at the foot of the cross. You need to surrender your life. You need to repent of your sins. That means to turn away. Turn away from the old life and put on Christ. Confess Jesus as your Lord. Believe in your heart that God had raised him from the dead. And the Bible says you do that and you will be saved. That's what he tells us. Would you do that today even? Why don't you bow with me for a word of prayer. As our worship team comes to close us with a song before we present Caleb and, and the baby dedication today, if you would just bow with me, and if you're here today, no, nobody looking around and, and eyes closed, and I, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to have anybody stand up and, and come forward unless you feel like you would like to do that. But if you're here today and you just say, you know what, Pastor Larry, I, I want to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've never accepted him as my Savior. I've never asked him to forgive me of my sin. If that's what you would like to do, I want to ensure, I want I just want you to know that God is listening to you right now. And he knows your heart. He knows where you're at. And if you're here today and you say, I want, I want to accept Christ as my Savior, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to lead you in a prayer. But all I want you to do real quick is simply just to raise your hand and put it right back down so that I could acknowledge you. And you'd be just simply saying to me, Pastor Larry, would you pray for me? I want to know Christ as my Savior today. With heads bowed, eyes closed, would anybody like to accept Christ today? Real quick, just raise your hand and put it right back down. I'd love to pray with you and lead you in a prayer. Anybody? Heavenly Father, today we just thank you and we praise you. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we had here to plant the seed of your word into the hearts of those that are present. I ask and pray, Father, that you would just continue to water that seed, help it to grow, grow to salvation.
Father, I thank you for those that are here, and I just to lift them all up to you. If there are any that are here today that are still struggling with the idea of, of who you are and how your son came to die for us, and they just have questions about that or doubts, Father, I pray you continue, continue to speak to their hearts, continue to work on them. And I ask and pray, Father, that everything that we do and say as we leave this place, that we would represent you, ultimately representing who you are in our life. It's in Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Why don't you stand with us as we worship one last song.
thank you that you are with us through all things. You're with us through the fire, through the storm, through the sunshine, through the rain, through the good times, through the bad. There is always another with us, and it is you. We lift you up. We praise your name. Amen.